Pets Talk America Radio. You are tuned in to yet another video episode where we spotlight the best and the brightest and also topics you want to know more about. And I don't need to tell any of you that heart awareness, heart health is so critical. And in February, we often put the spotlight on it, but it's really something we should be doing year round. I'm no expert on it, but you know, here on LTA Radio, we seek those that know, those that try to bring you relevant, practical information, get you to be the best version of yourself, especially when it comes to health. And I'm so excited and honored right now to have some newcomers on this program, but not newcomers, of course, uh, to the world of media outlets and also not to the information they're going to share today about your health. And you're going to be shocked on some of the connections they're going to make when it comes to your heart health and some things we often overskip and not think about. I'm so excited to have the one and only dentist with us, Dr. Barbara McCatchy is on with us. And also her husband, Dr. Eric Gouder is with us as well. And he is an internist, but he specializes in preventive cardiology. He's a cardiologist. We've got the best with us today. How are you all doing well? Are you doing well? I'm sure. Doing great. Doing great, Shana. Thank you. Awesome. Well, we have a tradition here on the Real Talk edition of Let's Talk America Radio. We ask all of our exclusive guests, to really take about a minute or so to explain what got them to this professional journey because I've seen the resume, right? I've seen the CV. I know how awesome and accomplished both of you are. But for those that are watching us, you know, it's so important they connect the humanity side, the human side, if you will, to those medical professionals helping us, especially during this period of COVID. So help us out. I'm going to start with you first, Dr. McGatchin. Oh, I was going to, I think we ought to start with Dr. Gould. <laughs> <laughs> I, will not, not debate, I will not debate a couple. They know what's best. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll start. Okay. I actually, um, I'm an oral systemic dentist. I, I call myself a complete health dentist because I understand that the health of the mouth is directly related to the health of the body. And uh, I am a founding member of an organization that came together called AASH, the American Academy of Oral Systemic Health. And we went to this meeting, myself and two hygienists. Um, it is an organization of bringing medical providers and dental providers together to be better advocates for our patients. So we heard some dynamic speakers uh, on how heart disease can be prevented, but they need like-minded dentists to be on their collaboration team because they realize that the inflammation is of the mouth is directly related to the health of the heart. So as we learned uh, at that um, association meeting, I came back to tell Dr. Goulder, who I was dating at the time, you've got to go see this, uh, this group of dynamic people and learn about how the health of the mouth is related to the health of, of the heart, the health of the mouth and the heart and I figured what a great uh, match for the two of us to start learning about this. That's really the start of our journey. <laughs> and so. And you want to hear what I said? Yes. Yeah. So she came back from this, de this dental meeting, right? And I, and she said, we got to go to this. And I said, I don't really want to go to some stinking dental meeting, <laughs> you know? So, and then it turns out she drags me to this preceptorship two days where doctors Brad Bale and Amy Deneen, uh, give you all the science behind what they're doing about inflammation and cardiovascular disease and and uh, all the root causes stuff. And I came back from this. So I was talking to my partner um, at we worked in a hospital system. I was talking to my partner. I said, you know, I've been a cardiologist now for 35 years, and this is the best. This was the best medical meeting I've ever been to. So um, so yeah. So I'll just move on to what. Yeah. So like I said, I've been a I've been a board certified cardiologist for 35 years. Uh, I was working for a hospital system and okay. doing what standard of care or end stage disease cardiologists do. You come in with a heart attack and we're finding out which, which artery is blocked and we're opening it up with stents and or you need bypass or all that stuff, taking care of high blood pressure and, and strokes and, and high cholesterol and all that sort of stuff. Um, and following the rules, okay, and the rules are laid down by the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, and they're called guidelines. So we have to follow the guidelines to, to practice standard of care. Okay. And I was just getting sort of burned out um, seeing people come back over and over again with the same problem. We'd fix an artery and they'd be back and they'd have another blockage. And we'd fix that and five years later, they got another blockage. And we're not curing anything. We're putting Band-Aids on problems. And so that's when I said, you know, after hearing Brad and Amy, uh, Brad Bailey, Amy Deneen talk, I said, you know, we got to, uh, I got to drop this and start trying to prevent all this stuff. So that's how we got here. 
Yeah. And, and thank you both for sharing because it certainly gives us a special touch and understanding of the teamwork and the partnership that you have. I've got an honest question for you that I think many of our viewers are probably thinking right now, right? And Dr. Ruler, you, you said, you know, it, it seems to be a Band-Aid placed on it. And I know Dr. McCanchy, you see, um, you, like you say, you say, you try to treat the whole patient. I understand that, you know, dental health or mouth health is not just isolated. Because I think so many of us think that, right? We think, well, I've got to get a cleaning. I've got to get a, a root canal. But that has nothing to do with the rest of my body. We're not looking at it in a holistic way. But the real question for real people is, is heart disease truly preventable? I mean, because I've heard so many stories, Dr. Guder, about people, they went in for this blockage and three months later, and then it was a heart attack. And for some people, it ended up being fatal. And sometimes I think laymen, right, the rest of us, not medical experts like you and your wife, we often say, you know, but they seem to have been walking. They started doing five days. They even did a marathon. And, and some of these things don't seem to work. And I know it may not be the question you want to hear um, here on this episode, but it's a question I think a lot of people wonder about. Yeah, so that's something that I explain to my patients all the time. So first of all, arterial disease is definitely preventable. And arterial disease may not just be coronary artery, but you know, which causes heart attacks, but it could be carotid uh, or cerebral arteries that cause, you know, strokes. Um, and we know that if we can figure out what's what inflammatory causes are driving your arterial disease. And that's what drives it. That's what causes the blockage to develop. That's what causes the blockage to get to grow inside the arterial wall and causes them to rupture. And then you make a blood clot and it's a heart attack or stroke. And so we know that it's inflammation. So we know that we have to go look for all the possible source of inflammation that we, that we know about. And some of it's stuff that we already do know about, like high blood pressure and high cholesterol, they're inflammatory, but it can also be your diet. It can be, it can be obstructive sleep apnea. It can be low vitamin D and most, you know, insulin resistance. Then most importantly, why we're working together, it can be periodontal disease and endodontal disease. Uh, so that's why, and we know that um, there's so much to talk about, but we know that if we, if we look for all those sources of inflammation, okay. we can slow down the arterial disease process, stop it and even reverse it. Wow. And so while most people think, well, you know, dad had a heart attack at 50 yeah. and I'm 48, and I'm going to have a heart attack. Yeah. No, it's not inevitable. Okay. If, if, you know, like we like to say around here, heart attacks are optional. Wow. You can say, we want to go down the pathway of, of health and getting all the inflammation under control, or we're going to stick our heads in the sand and let our periodontal disease smolder along. And most people don't know they have it. We can let our, you know, our sleep apnea and we can leave our, um, all those other inflammatory causes smoldering yes. along. And then, yeah, you are going to have that heart attack. So you've got great news for us. You said it can be reversible because I think so many Americans do have that family genetic disposition that's there, right? Dad, grandmother, grandfather. Dr. McCatcher, I want to turn my sights to you. I, and my journalism career, I've interviewed lots of cardiologists about heart disease and lots of nephrologists and endocrinologists and neurologists. And they've, they've made the link and a great arguments about heart disease. I, I'll be frank with you. This is the first time dentist, the first time I've had a, a dentist, right? <laughs> make an argument for heart disease. And, and it's not to say I have seen, you know, obviously some paperwork on saying, hey, you've got to make sure the whole body is being treated. Um, but you, I'm going to congratulate you because I haven't seen many dentists step out and vocally talk, uh, talk about it. Tell me about it. Because again, we have a struggle. We have a leap here to make because so many people, unfortunately, right? And sometimes you know this better than me. It could be cost. It could be cultural. It could be an attitude that came from the family where their dental health, right? They think of it as cosmetic, it, cosmetic if you will. It, it's this beautiful smile you and your husband have. That's all it is. You know, it, it has nothing to do with anything else. And I'm okay with that missing tooth. After all, granddad had it and he was just fine. So make that <laughs> argument for us. We're beyond a, a smile that's on camera. Well, 85% of our adult population in the U.S. has some form of periodontal disease. So, I mean, it could be, you could notice it from an odor when you're wearing your mask and uh, get your attention there. You could notice it if you have any bleeding when you brush or floss your teeth. Uh, healthy gums don't bleed. So, the, the, the premise of how heart disease and gum disease are related is there's there's a space between your tooth and your gum and it's called a pocket and once that pocket gets too deep then bacteria starts collecting down deep into the pocket 
Now we have saliva testing. We've evolved into saliva testing where we actually test 11 high risk bacteria that lives in your mouth. And this is one of the first objective testing that dentistry has had. Medicine has blood work and different things. And you know, you get your results and you change a medication or you change a lifestyle and you measure it again and you wanna know if it works. Dentistry's never had anything like that though I've been saliva testing for about eight years now. But there are five of those 11 high-risk bacteria that research shows are directly related to cardiovascular disease. So what I'm doing is I'm measuring the saliva and the dangerous bacteria are the bacteria that live deep down in the tissue and bone. They do not require air to live. So the longer they're down there, the more dangerous they become, your gums become swollen, your gums start to bleed, and now that gives the bacteria access into your body because you have one blood system, one blood flow, and you have 30 miles of blood vessels in 30, your body. 30,000, I'm sorry. <laughs> 30,000 miles of blood vessels in your body. So it gives all these access points for this dangerous bacteria to go down. And research has showed too, when they extract a blood clot from a carotid artery and they evaluate it, they find these oral bacteria in that blood clot. So they know that the bacteria that stays, does not stay in your mouth, it enters our body. So, you know, that's a, that's a red flag for odor. I mean, there's things that we can do even at home if you're not seeing a dentist, or, you know, like you should. There are some oral care probiotics, kind of how people take for gut uh, probiotics, but it's, it's a mint-like oral care probiotic that you can suck on and it actually will help kill some of the dangerous bacteria and replenish good bacteria. It also has, uh, releases hydrogen peroxide and with COVID, you know, we, we are very um, conscious of COVID virus in the dental office and it releases hydrogen peroxide, which helps kills COVID and, um, and it also whitens teeth. So that's one small thing uh, wow. the public can do, but um, Is that there's a, a lot of research out there right now on the oral system. The oral probiotic that you mentioned, is that available over the counter? You don't need a, a prescription or from a dentist office? You don't need a prescription, but you can order it online. It's called ProBio or Plus. Okay. Yes, and that that that's uh, will give you that mint like feeling. Nice. There's there's other products like uh, Peri Protect gel and trays. Okay. It's a 1.7 percent hydrogen peroxide gel that you can brush with or have custom trays made, and that actually pushes that oxygen down deep in the pockets, kills that dangerous bacteria because they don't want oxygen. Um, so. so I, I want to ask you this because we'll talk real people. Obviously, the two of you are very. Um, educated in the medical world. But when you say periodontal disease, for those that may not be as familiar, can you explain and break that down? What exactly is that? It's a bacteria-driven infection that is caused by bacteria mm -hmm. that if left on, on in between your teeth and your gums, it starts to destroy the, um, the connection. It start, starts with swelling and then it, the bacteria can start destroying the bone. And as the bone starts uh, progressing, then teeth become loose. Oh. And then that's when teeth usually are extracted. I see. Let me ask you this, and, and having parents and once having grandparents, I noticed that the older we all get aging, right, is a blessing, um, but we start to lose teeth more. I noticed that in my parents. Is that a connection to the older we get, heart disease becomes more prevalent um, as we age? Because I often I've interviewed other cardiologists, Dr. Gouda, and they have said, well, you know, some things are diseases of aging. Hypertension can be, I mean, obviously the older we get in women, as we lose estrogen, the older we get, that we're more at risk. Is that the case, Dr. McCatchy? Um no, I mean, everything is preventable and optional. So there, there's something that is driving that inflammation that we can correct and stop the process. Just like heart disease, it is not automatic with age. It's something that is driving it and we need to know what it is. And once we know what the root cause is, we can reverse it. I'm fascinated with the, again, the connection between heart disease and dentistry. Um, and so one, I would imagine, and you tell me, because I know obviously you're very understanding, you're saying if they're not seeing a dentist like they should, there's some things they can do at home. Um, but how often, practically speaking, should someone at least be going in for a checkup? 
I mean, just so because everything you explained, it may not be necessarily uh, known. And even if I'm going to a great preventive cardiologist like your husband, um, I've never known a cardiologist to really examine your teeth. So how often should people be going to the dentist? I do the examination on all of his patients. So oh, he, wow. He's learned a lot about dentistry, but he's not quite there yet for that. I've learned a lot of medicine. <laughs> well, you know, personalized care. Everybody has different different needs. Yeah, you yeah. know, if you have other underlying conditions like uh, diabetes or high cholesterol or things like that, you're more at risk. So ideally, you should be seeing a dental professional every three to four months. It has to do whether you have active periodontal disease or gum disease or you don't. So, you know, it's the insurance industry that really created that twice a year, every six months. Mm -hmm. And that's what they'll pay. And again, you know, it's not preventive health care, it's sick care. And it is great if you have insurance and that's the only way that will allow you to come in and visit the, the dental office, you know, obviously take advantage of it. But in our practice, we have high risk patients and most of Dr. Goulder's patients are in every three to four months okay. because the body only has so many soldiers to fight whatever they need to fight, you know, whether it's with diabetes, heart disease, um, dementia, diabetes, obstructive sleep apnea, which is a big driver of inflammation for both of our uh, professions. Wow. I'm not going to, I want to talk about something. Um, you said, of course, we can reverse it, right? You're saying that's possible. You gave us hope, right? I'm sure someone's like, yes, I don't have to stay in this spot. Um, but talk to us about uh, really diet and exercise, because you know, millions of Americans have heard that thrown around, right? Oh, diet and exercise, diet and exercise. And um, I'm going to be frank with you. I once knew a cardiologist and he, he'd sort of make this, and it's not a very funny joke. And I don't think he meant it to be funny, but he said, you know, when he tells patients diet and exercise, you know, certainly implement this, he'd often say that, but to some degree, diet and exercise got them here. And so I think his thinking was he didn't have somewhat a whole lot of hope that people would actually implement a whole change of diet and exercise. Now, Real talk for real people. Um, I know real life people too. And they get these diagnoses from their cardiologists or internists or endocrinologists. And they say, I'm going to do diet and exercise. And they're all for it for that week. They go, they go to their favorite search engine and they're just doing it. And then they've tried every new diet out there. If it's the egg diet, they're going to do keto. And not picking on those diets at all. But they say, I'm going to lose it. But weeks later, I check back in and it, it's the desire is gone. And so I say that to say all of this. Diet and exercise, I know you're saying it's reversible, but when it comes to real life people, what should people be thinking and doing to make it practical so they really, really can have a better quality of life and possibly live longer than mom and dad? So lifestyle modifications are probably or definitely the most important thing I do for my patients, okay. talking to them about lifestyle modifications. Um, you know, the American Heart Association's got, the, uh, got a list of the seven essentials for heart health and that heart health is a, that's a it's a really good lifestyle and it, you know and we know that if you follow those those rules about heart health which means you know things like your blood your cholesterol should be under 200 and for my patients with disease i want it even lower than that but okay. cholesterol under 200 and blood pressure under 120 over 80 and, and your bmi under 25 your body mass index under 25 um, things like that in your diet having a healthy diet okay. if you follow those things we know that we can prevent 75 to 85 percent of heart attacks okay Okay. The exercise is not hard. The biggest bang for the buck for exercise is 22 minutes a day. Okay. You don't have to be running marathons. You just have to get out there and get your heart rate up a little bit for, you know, if you're walking three miles an hour, that's not hard. 22 minutes a day. Um, and diet wise, you know, it's, it's what we all know we should be eating. Okay. Processed foods are a no, no. Okay, so if you walk around the outside of the grocery store, you're getting the whole the whole natural foods. Everything in the middle is all processed stuff, <laughs> right? So walk your way around the outside if you're, you know. And and as far as dairy products, you ought to be doing low fat dairy products. Um, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, 
fish and chicken way more than red meat. I'm not saying never eat red meat again, because I like steak occasionally too. But, but, you know, but the majority of what you eat should not be red meat, because we know that if you eat red meat or processed red meat, it increases your risk of heart attacks and stroke by uh, 15 to 20%. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and then, um, you know, and then the same diet is not right for everybody. So yeah. one of the things we do here at the Heart Attack and Stroke Prevention Center is we look at your genetics and see, we've got five different genetic tests we look at and see if you should be eating a keto diet because it's not right for everybody. Okay. Because a keto diet is going to be high in fat. There's people out there who should not be having a high fat diet because it makes them, what they do that, it, while it may... Um, not raise their LDL, their bad cholesterol, it does significantly raise their small dense LDL, which is the much more atherogenic version, much more, it causes much more arterial disease, much more plaque than regular LDL. So there's, and then there's other people out there that should not be eating gluten. Um, and so we need to, that we look at that be on, based on genetics also. Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of lifestyle modifications that we talk our patients about and then some supplements we give our patients to help boost their, uh, their ability to uh, fight off arterial disease. Uh, so yeah, lifestyle is probably the most important thing I talk to my patients about. And then you can talk about Bob Harper, who that's from a the biggest problem. Yeah. Right. So that was more genetic. That's, ge that's yeah. well, it's genetic. Yes. Yeah. So the Bob Harper story, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but you know, biggest loser coach who's do eat right every day and, you know, and exercises hard every day and gets his blood work checked frequently, make sure he's doing okay. And about three years ago, he, dropped, he was exercising in the gym and dropped dead on a bike, right? There were a couple of family practice docs there. They started CPR, they got him off to the hospital. He gets a stent, he survives all this, but he had a significant heart attack. And afterwards he's going, what the heck happened here? I exercise, I eat right, I get my blood work checked all the time and I had a heart attack. And so, so it took about six months to find somebody who finally did a blood test on him for a specialized bad cholesterol particle called LP little a, lipoprotein little a. It's genetically determined, okay? Your parents give this to you, okay? It doesn't respond to lifestyle modifications. So you can, oh. you can, have, you can be a vegan, you can okay. exercise all day long and it won't budge and it doesn't respond to statins. So you could be taking Crestor, Lipitor, whatever. Uh, you can take a truckload of it and your LP little a won't budge. So you got to treat it differently. So once he found that out, he's, he's got this big, you know, this big uh, soapbox he can stand out and talk about it. So he's all over LP little a now and telling everybody about it. And the medical community is coming around, but still people don't check it frequently. It's not part of the standard lipid profile that we normally do. Um, but there is an avenue to treat it. But like you're saying, because I think so many times we think of this lipidemia of the black cholesterol, we do think of the statins, of course, you know, lipitor, yeah. cholesterol, you can go, I mean, before that, the earlier ones, but you're saying if people are doing that, sometimes we have to dig deeper. Um, I recently read an article earlier this morning um, that appeared on Today, and it was about um, a woman, she was an African-American, one young woman at the time, about 48 years old, and her feet started swelling and her legs. And she went to her internist and a cardiologist, and they they said it was, you know, it was just, don't worry about it. It wasn't heart related. She did it a stress test at EKG, and they said she didn't have blockage. Um, two weeks later, when she was away for business, she had uh, what they called a widow, you know, better than I, widow, heart attack, and she was treated by a whole nother physician in a whole nother area. And according to the article, he was shocked that they did not recognize the signs. And the, her doctor and the cardiologist originally treated her sort of attributed to stress and didn't see it as that. Now, this other doctor, uh, he disagreed. He thought that it should have been a red flag. But I think I, I want both of you to really talk about the importance of body awareness and if we're going to an expert who, and, 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 I, and I say that with all due respect, and lots of physicians and medical providers, and have all, they have my respect, certainly. But if we're going to someone and they're not listening to us, and by the way, she also started having heart palpitations. I want to mention that too. That was also a part of her original uh, symptoms. If they're not listening, and, and she said they were the experts and, and she left it alone, would you encourage patients out there to be more persistent? to really say, I, I, my, my chest is bothering me daily. This cannot be normal. Certainly. I mean, I think that that's, that's our job as a physician is to listen to our patient, right? Um, and as, as we all know, women's symptoms from, heart, from coronary disease 
are a lot different than men. Men more often get the classic tightness in your chest, maybe radiating up to your neck or jaw or in your shoulders or arm. Um, women tend to be, you know, women are sneaky. So women... <laughs> <laughs> Only the symptoms there, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> women are stinky. You've got to really be looking for it because they, they complain about fatigue. They're For some reason, they're more anxious going on for a month or so. There's something going on. Uh, they, are, they don't get the classic chest tightness as much. Some do, but... Um, or for the fatigue, the shortness of breath, the... Uh, you know, and that, sh that's a, that should be a big red flag. And the problem is that um, most heart attacks are caused by a blockage that's not that bad, okay? Most heart attacks are caused by, um, are caused by 68% a, a of the time the blockage that causes a heart attack is a less than a 50% blockage. Oh, wow. 86% of the time, it's less than a 70% blockage. And so that's just where the stress test is gonna to start to pick up that you've got a problem, 70%. So only 14% of the time, if you have a heart attack, okay, and you'd had a stress test earlier that day or the day before, yeah. it would be abnormal. But 86% of the time, you can have a stress test and the, later the next day or the day after have a heart attack, but the stress test would have been normal. So it's the soft inflamed blockages that are going to rupture and cause the event. So yeah, she was probably that lady with the Widowmaker heart attack. That's the left anterior descending artery, the one going down the front wall of the heart, supplies the most of the heart muscle. Um, about, you know, yeah, probably about uh, half, maybe 40% of the heart muscle. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, if that blockage is, usually it's only a 50%. So we've all heard this story of the person who gets a, heart, gets a stress test, passes it with flying yeah. colors, walks out of the doctor's office and drops dead the next day or whatever. You know, I have, I've got a patient whose, whose dad saw his, his cardiologist getting the, the big okay, yeah. drops dead in the cardiologist's parking lot. Oh, okay. so I mean, we and that's why, you know, half the time, the initial sign or symptom that you've got arterial disease is when you either have a heart attack or drop dead yeah. Half the time. The lucky people are the ones that get chest pain or shortness of breath or fatigue and go see their physician get it figured out. Do be, an ad, do be a self advocate Absolutely. for yourself. Absolutely. Nobody knows your symptoms or something different than you do. And you know, the problem with, with our healthcare system now is it's faster and it's less yeah. personalized and it's, okay, it's okay. less engaging. And, and, you know, that's what, where we've come, you know, to get into more relationship style um, medical care. But you, I, ha I have a, a team member that has been going to a physician and just says, I don't think he's listening to me. I don't think he's really, because he's she's around this environment where there's actually time to have conversations and and really talk through concerns and goals and you know what 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 they're trying to achieve and dig deeper. So I, I think the healthcare system needs you know some realigning, slowing down. Um, to be better advocates for our patients. Uh, there are a lot of my colleagues that don't understand the oral systemic connection. Uh, there's a lot you know, of medical providers that don't. So if I do a saliva test and I see that they have high risk bacteria in their mouth for their heart disease, and they'll say, well, I'll go take it to my physician. And not all the physicians understand what we do. And they'll tend to poo-poo it because we don't know what we don't know. Right. So it really takes, I think, we all learn the same in medical and dental school. I believe it's what your interest is once you graduate that you start doing your own self-learning and trying to you know, find what your niche is and um, be better at what you want to create your medical and dental practice to be. And we just need to start collaborating more instead of everybody staying in their own lane, only focusing on just a little piece of the patient versus, you know, unifying. And I learned that more when we do, um, I don't know if you've heard of what dental clearances are, but it really is originally from orthopedic surgeons. When somebody's having an artificial joint, they will ask for a dental clearance, which I commend them because they understand the health of the mouth is, may influence their surgical site, you know, and their complications. Unfortunately, not all orthopedics do that, but mm -hmm. I commend the ones that do because they understand the connection. Um, but we, I just had a patient that's had three failed hip surgeries, 
was not my patient at the time, but once I found out that he had fa three failed hip surgeries, uh, replacements, I, I asked him to come into the office and he had chronic advanced periodontal disease, gum disease. Mm -hmm. He hadn't been to a dentist for 15 years and he was scheduled to go have his fourth surgery next week. And I, I just, we did the saliva test. We did an inflammatory panel. He's full of infection, full of inflammation, like we said. Uh -huh. And um, I contacted his orthopedic surgeon and spoke with him yesterday. And um, with the research I provided him and the education I provided him, he canceled his uh, fourth surgery. And this particular patient is gonna have some periodontal therapy, have six teeth taken out and then go in to have his uh, fourth artificial hip surgery. And I'm so convinced that the health, the chronic inflammation in his mouth is what caused his failures. Oh, wow. what, a, what a great link for you to identify that. Before we wrap up, I wanna talk about self-care and Dr. McCatcher, I wanna ask you this. Um, you know, women, we make up a great bit of society. Um, but women often have roles, uh, even with us having careers and working, there's a lot of pressure still on women of caring for the children or the household or arranging schedules or being the main caretaker for our aging parents or whatever it may be. And often, and I have girlfriends that do this, I have very good friends who will make sure that the husband or the partner, they, they have their appointments together or that the kids and make sure they're getting their wellness checked and they're getting the vaccinations for the flu and everything else. Um, but when it comes to themselves, they are last on the list. I have friends who have not had mammograms in a decade and they're at the point where they should be doing it or colonoscopies or any wellness checks or checking an A1C. They have no idea. They're like, I would know if there was a problem. We give so much to other people, which I'm sure Dr. Gouda is very, very proud for and many, many men are. But for the woman who is putting herself last, will you make a case where she does need to go see a dentist? She does need to get that wellness check and see if she needs to see a preventive cardiologist. Because I mean, if you're taking care of everybody else, but not yourself, who's gonna be here if something happens to you? I mean, I'm just putting it in layman's term. That was my answer. I said, you, you just explained why they should be coming because everybody depends on the lead woman of, of the family. And she is the, the one that-, that <laughs> And so much of this disease process is asymptomatic. Just like COVID, when you first get it, it can be asymptomatic and you spread it, right? People don't have any symptoms. You don't know that you've got arterial disease going on. It's silent until something rears its ugly head. Periodontal disease, most people just, you know, pass it off and they say, yeah, a little pink in the sink, it's okay, you know? And, and uh, diabetes, I mean, the, the CDC had a report uh, a few years ago, they said of the 330 million people in the country, 28 and a half million people have diabetes and know it. There's another 100 million people in this country who are insulin resistant. And most of the people who go on to have a heart attack have been insulin resistant for 10 to 15 years. You don't know you've got it unless you look for it. And it's inflammatory. It drives this whole process. So yeah, there's a lot of asymptomatic stuff out there that you won't know about unless you get checked. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I mean, we, we all know about that sandwich generation, right? You're taking care of the kids, you're taking care of mom and dad, they may not even be in the same city you're in, and they're getting sick and you're dealing with nursing homes and hospitals and stuff. Yeah. And yeah, you, yeah, you've got to look out for yourself because like I tell my colleagues about getting a, an, art, an arterial scan done to see if you've got evidence of disease, yeah. who's going to take care of your patients if you drop dead from a heart attack, right? Yeah. You've got to be proactive about your health. A little Who's bit of take care of your family. Yeah, a little bit of selfishness. And do you recommend, and I see commercials, we're in Atlanta. So we see commercials here on the radio where they're saying, come and get a carotid check. Do you recommend that as a cardiologist? So that's interesting. So the kind of scan that you would get done at the hospital or by one of these mobile services that drives around and does the scans, yeah. that's called a Doppler scan of your carotid. That's looking for the flow through the artery. And the flow through the arteries is normal until the blockage is 70%, okay? So we do a little bit different scan here. We do a, what's called a carotid intima thickness uh, test, okay, CIMT, and it's actually looking at the wall of the artery. We're looking to see where that plaque is growing in the arterial wall, because if your lining is thicker than it should be, that says that, that you've got inflammation and cholesterol building up. If we see plaque in there, it says, that says you've got arterial disease. 
you may not have any symptoms from it. And the carotids where we look is pretty much the last arterial bed that gets this stuff. So it's been going on a lot longer in your coronaries. That's the first place it gets this stuff. So we want to make sure that, you know, if you've got disease, we're getting on it. We're going to figure out what's driving it. Okay. Go look for all those inflammatory causes. Find out what's driving it and treat that. And then we can use the CIMT, the carotid scan that we use to follow it. Make sure that the lining is getting younger. It's getting thinner. Make sure that the plaque is shrinking down and calcifying because it's the calcified plaque that's stable. Okay. So when I had my first CIMT, I was 55 and my arteries came back as an 83 year old. And I'm exercising. I don't eat fat foods. I, I don't eat saucy stuff. Yeah. Um, but what, by having that knowledge, that knowledge was power, like I said, so I could start to reverse it because had I not known, I could have had a heart attack in 15 years. But because I had a window of looking at my artery and have knowledge, I could start making changes now. And then the next year I was down to 77 with my arteries. So I'm, I'm working on, you know, reversing it. And my art, you know, my chronological age is going up. So eventually I'll start meeting in the middle. <laughs> You are watching Let's Talk America Radio. I'm Shana Thornton, on air host and executive producer. We're wrapping up an amazing conversation with two experts, a preventive cardiologist and a dentist. Believe it or not, there is a connection with heart disease with the dental uh, world. And so excited and honored to have all this great information. Before you both leave us, I have to ask this. There is a growing trend out there for certain groups um, of a natural lifestyle, right? And I know, Dr. Guda, you did mention if someone wants to be a vegetarian, you're saying less meat, more plant-based. That's great. Um, but the natural component for some, not all, is also coming with, hey, I don't need to be on medicine. I don't even want my physician to bring up medicine. Um, I'm going to all do it the natural way. What's your take on that? I mean, because I think on one note, and I, you both are advocating for people to be empowered, get the information, make the most of it. But you all know better than I do, there are patients out there, and I think they're in the millions, who hear you say, Dr. Goodery, well, you got to be on a, a statin. You've got to you got to get on this water pill. Things that there's some data behind it that can help long term, even with strokes. And they don't want to hear it because they're like, I'm not getting on any dental medication. I'm not getting on any heart medication. I'm good because my neighbor got on that and she couldn't even get out of the bed. Help us and make the case um, for medicine against it. So uh, we use some prescription medications, but we don't. I mean, I don't. I use them as a as a bridge to getting off of them. I don't want you on, you know, every medicine's a poison, okay? It's got, everybody's got the potential to be hurt by something, okay? So I don't want you on, med on prescription medications any longer than you have to be. However, things like statins, mm -hmm. I mean, we all think we take the, the statin to lower our cholesterol and I can watch my diet and lower my cholesterol. However, the real way that the statins work is they're an, a potent anti-inflammatory drug for the lining of the artery. So if you've got inflammation going on and I've got inflammatory markers that I'm looking at and I'm saying your arteries are on fire, we need to get you on a statin. Now you may not need to take it for too long, but we need to get this under control. And then you can work on exercise and lifestyle and supplements, that sort of stuff. And the, the, the other problem I run into a lot is people wanna be on red, red yeast rice, red rice yeast. And because it's that Mevacor, the first statin out there, Lovastatin, that's where they got it from, okay? And it's natural, so they want to take that. But there are reports in the literature of people killing themselves by taking too much because all the statins have a potential to damage their liver. And these people got hepatotoxicity, they got, you know, they eventually died from that. So just because it's natural doesn't mean it's not going to hurt you. There are <laughs> mushrooms and there are mushrooms, right? You can eat, you can eat portobellas all day long, but if you eat Amanita muscaris, <laughs> You're done. So, I mean, but it was natural. It was a mushroom. Right? So, so, yeah, I, we, we really want to stress lifestyle. That's the most, that's the most important thing okay. we do for our patients, but. And we, have markers to know that yeah, they're working. I them. mean, you know, yeah. we, we, we empower our, our patients to, to try what, you know, give them the knowledge, give them some tools. And then we follow up every two, three, four months. Is it working? You know, yeah. so that's really, I think, the key. Yeah. 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 So key to know and be aware of it. And you're right. And I get the diagnosis from the doc's office and say, I'm going to do it on my own. And you never return because you don't know if what you're doing is working or not. Right. Before we get out of here, we obviously have to bring up COVID, which has devastated the world around the globe. As many of you, everybody knows, many, we're approaching 500,000 lives. Um, lost due to COVID-19. Um, 
within one year. Um, that's heartbreaking news. As a cardiologist, as a dentist, um, right now I want to close on you all giving some, some words of wisdom or your advice when it comes to COVID. Many of you know throughout the country, uh, many Americans have really tired of the COVID news and things, and they're saying, forget it, I'm, I'm going on with my life. Um, and obviously we see some progress in COVID, right? Some of the vaccinations that has helped. Um, but experts are still saying we should, this is not the time to let our guard down. It's not a time to go to a party with a thousand people without a mask um, and lose what they think is just common practical sense. Help us out because the psychological side of it, and you all treat the patient holistically, psychological side, I mean, many Americans have lost people they know, they're tired of it. They want to move forward. They want hopeful, positive news. And sometimes in, internally in our heads, we say, I want positive news. I'm going to push out all the bad news out. And we go on with danger or behavior that's potentially danger, dangerous. So let me say first that if you have underlying arterial disease, any infection you get puts you at risk of having an event, having a heart attack or a stroke. Okay. Because, and, and if you've got periodontal disease, as 85% of the adult population has, you are, and you get COVID, you're, this, is, this report just came out this week. Um, it, periodontal disease and you've got COVID, you're three and a half times more likely to end up in the ICU. You're four and a half times more likely to end up on a ventilator and you're nine times more likely to die from the COVID because you've got periodontal disease. And it's like, it's like Dr. McClatchy was saying earlier, we only have so many soldiers in our body to fight off infections, okay? So if they're busy, they all revved up trying to be, take care of the periodontal disease, you don't have what, you know, you don't have the immune response left over to take care of COVID. So yeah, there's a, and you know, it's not just getting the COVID, it's the complications from it. It's getting pneumonia, it's getting, you know, having a heart attack, getting, you know, uh, internal organ failure, liver, kidneys, that sort of stuff. So, and lungs. And then, yeah. uh, you know, the, the virus lives in our nasal passage and in our mouth, which mm -hmm. is why, you know, dentistry was such a high risk, you know, place mm -hmm. to go. But, you know, and you're inhaling, you're ingesting. I mean, so anything that's in your mouth is, is entering your body and into your lungs and causing that infection. So having as clean of a, of a, of a mouth as possible by using, you know, oral probiotics and hydrogen peroxide and molecular iodine rinses, those are all things that kill bacteria as well as COVID so that you can help keep the environment as clean as possible will always decrease your chances for uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. Great. 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 Hypertonic Great. saline too. Hypertonic saline, you know. Spray your nose. nose so you can get that. And that, that allows your body to, um, to kill off the COVID virus as well. Wow. So great information. Thank you too so, so much. I think we have so much that our viewers will take back to their cardiologists and dentists, I'm sure, especially the dentists. They're going to be empowered by this. Uh, <laughs> certainly, we certainly hope that all providers are, are providing the information that you two are sharing with us and others today. Where can our viewers and listeners go for additional information about your practice or information we all may share? So you can find me on the web at the Heart Attack, uh, um, <laughs> Heart Attack and Stroke Prevention Center of Central Ohio.com. And Barb is McClatchyDDS.com. We're in Worthington, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And um, we're the first in the country to have a dentist and a cardiologist working together. So we do believe uh, we're the match made in heaven. <laughs> Happy <laughs> Valentine's Day, everybody. That's right. And yes, just yes, remem yes. remember the bacteria in your mouth when you're kissing your Valentine can be transferred over to your partner. So you want both you and your partner checked for periodontal. Right. Okay. Well, wait, and that, I know we're closing up, but is that true to that? If you're well, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, wait. So. <laughs> She's got patients who she was having a hard time treating. And then they say, well, let's get your wife in here and check her too. And then, oh, wow. now yeah. we understand. Yeah. We have an article we hand out in February that says, are you kissable with the candy <laughs> heart on it? Because we want patients, you know, could be working really hard to be clearing their, their gum disease and we can't get it cleared, but they're being reinfected by their partner. So, wow, that's interesting. So, I mean, bacteria can't be transferred where it enters our body from who we're kissing and, and good information to know because you know often people can just kind of sub kiss a lot. Yes, <laughs> yeah. That's interesting and good to know. Good information, knowledge puts a, puts a new meaning to you're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> News is powerful. What people do with it is up to them. But thank you so much for sharing. Thank you both for being on with us on Let's Talk America Radio. Great conversation, fun conversation in time for Heart Month and Valentine's. Of course, we couldn't have 
a better duo with us, a husband and wife team. Um, thank you so, so much. Thanks for watching Let's Talk America Radio. More episodes coming your way. Of course, we offer real talk for real people. That's you. Stay healthy, everyone.